It, um, this webinar will be an introduction into direct democracy and its best practices and just the basics of it. So today we're having our Democracy 101. Here we're just going to be explaining what exactly direct democracy is. We have our first speaker, Klaus Hoffman, who will speak about direct democracy and its law from our navigator, which is um, a project that we have here at Democracy International. Our second speaker will be Karen um, Ina from May Democracy. She, um, May Democracy is our sister organization and they work on direct democracy on all political levels here in Germany. And she'll be giving us a bit of context in terms of um, the best practices of direct democracy. And then our last speaker is Caroline Vernine. She will be speaking about um, some practical examples from around the world. Our first speaker will be Klaus. Um, Klaus, are you gonna be sharing your screen? Yes, I would like to share to my screen. Yeah, um, Klaus is a sociology, a sociology professor and he works on our navigator here at Democracy International um, with um, in between us and the University of Wuppertal and he'll be giving us a bit of the law about direct democracy. Um, so yeah, over to you, Klaus. So I will share my screen now, okay? So as I already started to explain, it's direct about direct democracy. And of course, we are moving ourselves inside a democratic system when we talk about direct democracy. We can talk a long time about what is a democracy, but I just uh, want to mention three, uh, three terms like the rule of law human rights and of course elections. And then asking ourselves about what is direct democracy. And this is the first issue I want to, uh, to share with you. It's, a, in other words, you can uh, define direct democracy as a decision-making instrument inside a democracy which includes, and that is important, a popular vote means at the end, people will decide on issues. So topics, issues, not on persons, because we also have the recall uh, instrument, which is about recalling a person from its office. In only talking here with direct, when we talk about direct democracy, uh, on issues. And it, a popular vote does not include a, a, a decision on whether the final popular vote is binding or it is just consultative. Uh, this is not decided automatically when we're talking about popular votes. And now let's see uh, how it the, about forms of direct democracy. There are a lot of possibilities about what is about direct democracy, instruments, uh, individual instruments and similar. So basically, sorry. Basically, we are talking about top to down instruments or bottom to up instruments. In the case of top down instruments, we have as author, so who is having the idea and writing a text or something similar, typically authorities. Initiator is also authorities and we call it in the navigator category, all these types, top to down plebiscites. In, in the next uh, version, we have bottom up uh, instruments. And this means that the author, uh, the author of a proposal can be as example an authority but the initiator is always, they are always the citizens. And in the navigator category, we have two uh, uh, 
uh, instruments. The first is the citizen initiative, where the citizens have all their uh, uh, um, they have all the power in the sense they initiate it, of course, but they also have orders. And finally, the by they decide uh, finally in the in the vote. This is what we call a citizen initiative. In the case of referendums, people have the possibility to veto a law which is decided, as example, by parliament or by a president. There are two main exceptions. The first is that we also include the obligatory referendums. These are usually initiated by law uh, and most often they are in the case also written down in the constitution. And a second instrument as exception the so-called agenda initiative, uh, which is a mixed type of, uh, uh, of instrument because the decision maker are representative authorities or other authorities. And this is not a real, in quotation marks, direct democracy internet instrument in so far. But we included it because it's often used as trigger of um, uh, a citizen initiative. So it's not unusual that before you can uh, go for the initiation of a citizen initiative, that you first have to do an uh, agenda initiative. Therefore, you have a lot of different instruments available, usually worldwide. Who, uh, where you can, which can you can use, and of course, all these instruments need a legal basis, and this legal basis is usually a law. Citizen in initiative means also that uh, you have to collect a certain amount of signatures to uh, become, uh, to make it possible that there will be a popular vote at the end. Same is in the case of uh, a referendum, so means a veto against a representative law. Uh, you need normally less signatures to have a veto, make, make a veto possible by a popular vote. It, uh, so these are the types of uh, uh, of possibilities, how a law can rule about uh, direct democracy instruments. The next point is that, of course, the law which we have here as an example, the law for, uh, for citizen initiatives is describing certain phases. The phase of preparation, which means basically to uh, the application of, uh, of a, to, to apply for the uh, instrument of a citizen initiative. Then it means second phase is the realization, it means uh, mainly the phase of collecting the signatures, which will be in the third phase verified by authorities. And the next phase is distribution would mean that there is, if you everything is gone so far well, uh, you are, are campaigning for uh, a decision on the voting day. And the last phase is, of course, the implementation. And as already said, it is not always binding or uh, in some cases, consultative instruments. There is a lot to uh, talk about the law and the possibilities inside the law prepared for, uh, given for the uh, authorities uh, to rule the process. And I cannot talk uh, in this uh, time limit I have about the possibilities, how this law can be. Uh, uh, made or will give you uh, the uh, 
uh, hurdles or no hurdles, just a short look at it within the case of war rooms. You see that these group, there are a lot of possibilities for war rooms, means you have to uh, achieve a certain amount of signatures and these quorums uh, can be combined with every other things. And, and now at last, I will show you uh, uh, the country ranking by number of votes for the last 25 years worldwide, giving you an impression about how often it is used. And you see on first rank is always Switzerland, also, uh, although Switzerland has no plebiscite instruments. On second place, uh, very surprisingly, Ecuador. On third place, the island of Palau. On fourth place, Italy. And on, last, uh, on, the, on the fifth place, uh, it's Micronesia. So these are the first five uh, ranking numbers of countries. There are a lot of more, but I'm showing you here only countries which have each possibility in the uh, constitution or in, in laws. So that's about a short introduction on, uh, on the direct democracy. And I thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Klaus. We feel very very fortunate to have caught you because Klaus is retiring at the end of this month um, and we will certainly miss your expert opinions. Um, I'm going to hand over to Ina now. Um, Ina's going to just give us a bit of um, insights about, about um, the direct democracy standards. Um, Ina? Hi everyone, um, I'm very sorry. I have a kind of um, like issues with the V connection. I hope you can understand me uh, because I was sometimes finding it very hard to uh, yeah listen or to to understand what Klaus said and Londika said before. So yes, um, yeah, as it was said before, my democracy is a professional professional organization for direct democracy. Um, at the German level, or mostly at the German level, and um, we argue that direct democracy has a lot of benefits for the citizens and the polit politicians, but only if um, the quality of the direct democratic instruments is good. And yeah, unfortunately, I haven't pre prepared some slides for you, so I will just uh, yeah talk and um, yeah present you um, my uh, yeah my ideas for. Uh, what are good direct democratic uh, rules. So um, the first um, thing I want to say is, or the first question we ask is, are there clear and legally standardized rules for direct democratic, uh, for like citizens initiatives? So uh, we said that the procedures and deadlines for referendum or for citizens initiative needs to be laid down in law. Um, and these includes, for example, different forms for um, uh, the signatures uh, that, what, that needs to be selected, uh, collected or uh, the time in which these uh, signatures need to be collected, the, the topics that are permissible for direct democracy, democratic initiatives, legal regulations for the signature list, and so on. And we say that these regulations need to be set in the constitution or in um, several executive laws so um yeah uh, everyone has to chance to prepare for the different requirements uh, that appear and all players in the context like the parliament the citizens um everyone needs to adhere to the same regulations and yeah um a second big part is the question um uh, are the initiative and the parliament at eye level. So we think that is uh, crucial for good um, democratic, direct democratic initiatives is that um, 
on the one hand, the turn off of a decision made by the citizens in a referendum has the same political weight as um, a decision made in parliament itself. Um, so they are both binding. Um, and additionally, we think that the best, um, yeah, the best use of direct democracy is if all topics that can be decided on by a parliament um, are also permissible for a referendum. So there are no regulation of topics. Um, like all this, they have the same topics. Still, we think that the topics for a um, referendum needs to match with the constitution. So um, we argue that there must be uh, a protection of minorities so that like there's no referendum uh, against, for example, um, or that can harm religious group, religious groups or something. Um, one third uh, measurement for quality we see is um, are there quorums? What kind of quorums are there? And are they realistically reachable? So um, first of all, uh, as I said before, as it was mentioned before, there's all, um, every time when you have a citizen's initiative or veto initiatives, you need to collect some signatures and um, get what comes when it comes to the quality of um, the instrument. Um, we see oh, the quorum for the signatures needs to be realistically reachable at the one hand. So uh, because um, to make it practical for citizens to come up with the citizens initiatives. However, on the other hand, um, it needs or the quorum for signatures needs to be high enough to ensure that the topic at hand is relevant for a significant number of people so that there are no minorities that can make the way and um, yeah, bring up topics that are not interested or um, important for a bigger group of people. And um, additionally, there are some co sometimes co so-called voting or turnout forms that needs to be met when it comes to the referendum. And um, if you have these uh, turnout forms, they um, must be met to make the referendum legally binding. And these ones are either in terms of participation, like you need a certain share or number of people that needs to participate in the referendum to make it binding, or um, you need, uh, or there's, um, um, sorry, a chrome in terms of consent. So you need a certain share of all people, um, for example, that are available to vote to give their consent to a certain issue to make the uh, referendum legally binding. And well, as, what I can say from a uh, Medimkratie's perspective is uh, we oppose voting forums because we argue that they may encourage boycott strategies and therefore distort the result of a referendum. Um, Additionally, they can hinder public discussion because what we see um, in many cases, like we have these voting forums in Germany for um, on the local level and on the um, state level, and what we uh, well, in some states at the state level, and what we see is that opponents of a referendum often do not promote their um, yeah their arguments because the idea if if you don't come up and go into the discussion, uh, um, maybe you have some people that don't know about the referendum and they don't take part. So um, opponents may just um, sometimes may just sit at home and um, hope that the referendum fails on um, because of the vote, because the voting um, or turnout crimes are missed. And um, yeah, we often or sometimes see those referendums fail be, uh, because they don't meet the turnout, although a majority voted with yes. And what we say that this is kind of a twisted democracy when people that uh, stay at home prevail in a referen referendum. Um, another issue I want to talk about are the deadlines, uh, which are also important when it comes to the quality of um, direct democratic instruments, uh, in, um, because uh, the number of signatures as well as, as the time frame in which the signatures needs to be collected, they both have a great impact on the success of a citizen's initiative because 
longer deadlines enable the citizens to collect the needed amount of signatures, to talk to people that are outside the circle of initiatives, uh, initiatives and well, make it easier or help to discuss a topic more broadly because he has yeah, more time. And um, additionally, if you have a longer deadlines and for example, different stages of a process, it prevents um, from quick shots or rush decision based on um, a scandal, for example, or current sentiments. So uh, if you have longer, longer uh, process and different stages, you also enable all citizens to inform themselves more broadly and to wide different arguments. Um, and then there are some like additional requirements we see for direct democratic instruments. These are like um, if a draft law is going to be voted, for example, the subject must be clear and understandable for all it. For all citizens so yeah everyone understands what is going to be voted um then another issue we have is um is the collection of signatures possible everywhere um because in some states in germany we have it that the that you can only collect signatures in municipality municipal buildings like city halls so everyone who wants to sign um a citizens initiative need to come to the city hall um to post their signature and um but we think what is way better um is the free collection so you can collect signatures on the streets in stores whenever wherever in trains and bus stations um because we say that um yeah this is this is a good standard because it's an able public discussions and um the unfree collection in city halls is a, like an unnecessary hurdle um, for people that maybe may want to sign an initiative but live too far away from the city, the city hall or it's just not practical to go there because they also have uh, like um, sometimes kind of tight opening hours. So um, yeah, this is it would be a good standard to make it um, to make it uh, free. Um, another good good standard we see, for example, in Switzerland is um, the voting booklet. And the question is there a voting booklet or something like something um, similar similar with all, all relevant information um, that everyone that can vote gets right in front of the um, referendum. So the booklet is kind of a tool to help people to um, yeah, to inform themselves and to come up with an yeah informed um, answer to and to 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 vote and know all about the arguments in favor and against a certain issue. And in uh, Switzerland, you get this booklet like in front of every vote, uh, in front of every uh, referendum. And the initiative that started a citizens initiative, for example, they have the chance to write down their arguments and other initiatives, politicians, etc., um, and so on can give like counter arguments and everyone has, but they are like at the same um, length. So yeah. To make it fair for both sides. Um, yeah, then uh, one other aspect is uh, the question if there is interaction with the parliament. So um, does the parliament deal with the issue at hand at an early stage? Do the, uh, the initiatives have the opportunity to speak to parliament or to speak in parliament? Um, has the parliament the right to uh, to submit a counter proposal when it comes to voting? Um, or is there maybe uh, also the chance that initiative in parliament can come up with a compromise? Um, because these processes lead uh, to, more to more transparency and to give the chance for initiatives to continue on their suggestions and maybe change it a little bit. And um, also, a good practice would be if there's a pre-check if a referendum is legally admissible, not in terms of content, but in terms of um, yeah, if it fits to the constitution, etc., uh, before the referendum takes place. This is not the case in all uh, countries. Um, yes, because sometimes uh, I think it's in the United States. There are some some states that don't have this kind of uh, pre-check, and sometimes. A referendum took part and after the referendum comes um come some people that say okay this is not 
this is not legally admissible. And then, yeah, people have voted on something. And afterwards, they say, okay, well, this was not admissible. So, yeah. Um, then we have the role of public authorities. Um, what would be good practice if um, there are some public authorities that offer advice and support for the initiatives to help them to avoid some mistakes. Um, and additionally, there should be strict deadlines that determine when the referendum should take place. And I think what is kind of a very good practice is in Switzerland, we have the um, for what they call um, voting Sundays. So these days were set um, beforehand and an initiative know if they um, hand in the citizens initiative or the veto initiative, they know which voting Sunday um, their initiative will be voted on. So um, yeah, this is, I think, kind of a good standard. Um, yeah, and last but not least, there must be a fairness and equal opportunity for all participants um, of the process. So um, supporters and opponents must have the same chance to place their arguments if they want. So, uh, for example, they have the same scope in the voting booklet, uh, as I said before. Um, also, we say that the use of public funds by the government to campaign in favor or against a certain issue is uh, prohibited. So, yeah, it comes to this kind of eye level between um, politicians and initiative thing as well. And um, yeah, what we think would be nice uh, or very good one is um, if initiatives have the chance to get a refund of the costs that an initiative brings with it, because um, we know that um, yeah, doing a citizen's initiative is not only quite time intensive, but also cost intensive, um, especially in the United States, you need a lot of money to run um, a citizens initiative and what would be good practice but i think it's not practice uh, not uh, there yet is to get a refund of what you've spent to uh, campaign to collect the signatures etc for your citizens initiative um okay i think i'm running a little bit out of time but i had some some uh, examples prepared shall i give a short overview or maybe if there's interest later um, maybe a very short one if you can keep it really short. Okay, yeah, I, I, okay, okay, I try. Um, I came up with uh, actually four examples from around the world. Um, yeah, first of all, Switzerland is like the home country of direct, or often seen as the home as the home country of direct democracy. They have one of the highest numbers of direct democratic processes in total. Um, but I think it's quite the regulations are quite fair um, in terms of how many signatures need to be collected and what time. Um, and also, uh, yeah, as I said, the, for the voting booklet, the um, having these four voting Sundays um, is good practice. Um, then coming to Asia, I would say that Taiwan is a good example. Um, it has very fair quorums to the for the collection of signatures. Um, However, as like we have one and a, one and a half percent within six months, which is quite good. Whatever what I would say is um, not so good practice here is that the voter turnout for citizens initiatives needs to be at uh, twenty five percent, and um, some of the citizens initiative are like generally suggestions, and there are no as I know no clear regulations on how to make them binding. Um, yeah, this would be some kinds uh, or some uh, po uh, two points of critique. Um, coming to Latin America, I would say that Uruguay uh, would be one of the best examples from Latin America um, because the processes, they have the veto initiative, the citizens initiative and the mandatory referendum on the national uh, level and they are you know, all legally binding. Uh, however, the chromes are quite high in Uruguay. Um, so for a veto initiative, the signatures of 25% of the electorates are needed and in um, for a citizens initiative of 10%. And when you come um, from a citizens initiative to a referendum, they have a voter turnout of 35%, which is quite high. But still, we see that there were about, I think, about 20 referendum in the past. 30 years of practice. So there's, uh, despite the high um, 
from uh, the high thresholds, there's still a good practice. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, Ina. Um, our last speaker will be probably giving us a bit more examples um, just from around the world. And we have Caroline. Um, she is our democracy, our, our global, she is our global um, program manager. And she works on the international community as well as the um, as well as um, organizing the Global Forum on Modern Direct Democracy, which is the biggest forum on direct democracy. Um, so Caroline, um, over to you. I, I know you have a, a couple of pictures you wanna show us as well. So maybe if you can share your screen. Yes, thank you very much. Um, yeah, so my name is Caroline Bernayan. Um, I am the Global Community Manager, uh, Community Building Manager at Democracy International. I'm trying to share my screen. Can you see that? Yeah, okay. Um, it's just some illustration because I have the difficult task now. We've heard from this, uh, we've heard sort of the theoretical framework and the different kinds of direct democracy uh, that exists. What are the standards for best practices and, and good quality of processes, which isn't necessarily um, a matter of, of typology. And so I have the difficult task now of sort of making that um, making that seeable and, and understandable and legible. So I've, I've tried to come up with, uh, for each of these different type of um, instruments that exist out there, I've tried to come up with an example. Um, so yeah, so Klaus at the beginning gave us a very helpful overview of like the typology um, of direct democracy as we use it on the direct democracy navigator. And, and we should post a link to that in the chat because it's a very uh, interesting website for anybody who's interested in these instruments. Um, Right, and so um, I'm going to start with uh, with bottom up. Uh, so what we refer to as, as citizens initiatives or, or initiative rights, and this basically means any tool where citizens can collect signatures um, to trigger some sort of policy action. Um, and the first type of tool that that we can talk about is one where citizens collect signatures, um, but they do not get to decide in the end. So we call it an agenda setting initiative. That means that um, if citizens can manage to reach a certain threshold of signatures, um, the parliament or the government um, or, or um, an, an authority of the representative um, democracy um, decides then what to do with it. And so we have we see petition instruments like this, for example, in the German parliament or in the English, uh, in the British parliament. Um, but we also have one, and this is the only existing um, trans tool, tr tool of transnational direct democracy right now in the world, um, in the European Union. Um, so in the EU, um, citizens have the right to collect signatures, and if you can manage to collect one million signatures in at least seven member states, so this is important because um, the EU is of course concerned with um, that it wouldn't only be citizens from the big countries, you know, if you, if you, it would be relatively easy to collect one million signatures in France and Germany, for example, um, but then all the citizens initiatives would come for there, from there, so this geographical um, criterion that they have of seven countries um, is very important there. So if you can manage to collect one million signatures in seven countries in the EU, then the Commission commits itself to, to responding to this, um, to your proposal. Um, and that can be either um, we like what you're proposing and we're going to use all of it or some of it, um, or we don't like it, but they have to motivate why they will not implement it. Um, and so this is very important. They have to explain why they don't think it's a good idea. Um, and so this is a relatively new direct democracy tool. It's existed for 11 years, but in those 11 years, uh, it's been used 100 times. So 100 different committees have, um, has, have submitted uh, European citizens initiatives and 12 of those, so that's actually quite good rate, about a little over 10%, um, have, read, have met the 1 million threshold, which is very difficult to reach. Um, and, and have had some policy impact. And so um, you can see here on my slide, I just brought pictures. Um, on my slide, you can see the end the cage age uh, was a citizens initiative that uh, reached the threshold, I believe last year. Um, and they uh, their proposal was to ban factory farming um, in the EU. So to have better living conditions for animals, uh, for farm animals. Um, and they reached a 1 million, thresh 1 million signature threshold and the European commission um, basically um implemented all of the all of their proposals um immediately so that is 
Um, that is really a success story that we see. Um, of course, there are also initiatives that reach the threshold and, and that are not happy with uh, where, where the commission doesn't take sufficient action and that, that, that don't like that, um, which, um, which of course um, can be criticized. Um, but in any case, if you meet the 1 million signature threshold in the EU, also the parliament commits itself to, um, to listening to you. So it can, all, it can always still be that the European parliament um, then implements some of, the, some of your proposals um, and something that we've noticed and that maybe wasn't entirely intended um, is that it is, um, it's a really good tool for civil society to build alliances across borders. So like, for example, in the KHH, you saw um, animal rights uh, organizations in all of the different uh, European Union uh, countries, member states, uh, linking up together and working on this. And then so it's, a, it's also a very good tool actually for civil society. So. Um, then, as Ina has said, so sort of the 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 flagship or the standard of of of, that, of good direct democracy um, is is Switzerland. So this is really the country that has the most practice um, with direct democracy in the world. They vote um, four times a year, so they have the and these voting dates are known years in advance. You can go and check right now um, on which days you could go vote in in twenty thirty if you wanted to, um, and um, Citizens, so it's the same in, in Switzerland, citizens can collect signatures, um, but these signatures don't just go to the parliament, they go to the people. So if you collect 100,000 signatures within a time of 18 months in Switzerland, um, then your question, of course, it's if it's um, if it's allowed and, and if it fits the legal framework, then your question will be put to all of the people. So it will be asked to everybody on one of the referendum days uh, that is coming up. It will be scheduled for a referendum. Um, and uh, yeah, so the picture that you see here, this is the, the Pflege Initiative or the CARE Initiative. Um, and this was really interesting because um, while around the world uh, we, were, we were struggling with the Corona pandemic and, and it was very difficult um, for, for everybody to, um, to know what to do because we were all in a new situation and we had a very big discussion about how to strengthen our healthcare and about the, the, the sort of the, the the pressure on our healthcare systems in Switzerland, they voted on strengthening the healthcare system. So, um, you know, while in the rest of the EU, you had countries um, implementing emergency law saying that that, that, that was necessary to be, um, to be effective and to be, to be uh, responsive and quick. Um, in Switzerland, they actually took it to the people um, and they voted on um, better condition, better working conditions for nurses, uh, better, uh, better education um, for medical staff um, and so on. So that was the CARE initiative and that took place in 2021, that vote. Um, so, and that is what we call a citizens initiative. Uh, citizens initi initiative. So the, the outcome of that is binding. So there is no quorum. So in Switzerland, it doesn't matter how many people show up to vote. Um, the, what matters is that more than half of them uh, think that it's a good idea. Um, and what we see with this is, some people have pointed out that in Switzerland, the turnout is usually quite low, that, it, that um, at every given ref referendum day, maybe 60% of people will uh, show up to vote, but we see that it's not the same 60% always coming. So people will pick the topics that are interesting to them. Um, right, but there is a geographical quorum in Switzerland with, uh, because they have, of course, different language communities. They have the German language community, the French language community, and the uh, Romanche language community. And because of that, there's a geographical quorum, meaning that half of the cantons, uh, so Switzerland is made out of um, member states, basically, um, which are called cantons, and half of the cantons need to be in favor of a proposal for it to pass. Um, it is also possible, and that's my next example, um, it is also possible that after you have collected signatures in Switzerland, that the government says we uh, we like this initiative, but we actually have a counter proposal. We have a better idea, um, and so in that case, um, I will show you now. So I, I'm sharing with you an example from um, the city of Lucerne in Switzerland, where the the opposition opposition parties had uh, launched an initiative for a climate friendly Lucerne for a climate strategy in Lucerne. Um, 
and no, sorry, the, the government parties had launched an initiative for the for a climate for a climate friendly city, and the opposition parties um, wanted to sort of were agreed with that, but not completely. So they made it a counter they made a counter proposal, um, and in that case, people get asked, you know, do you like the strategy that was first proposed? Do you like the second strategy? And then as a third question, if you have to choose between both of those, which one would you prefer? Um, so that is, um, that's a very interesting way of sort of um, finding out what people prefer. Right, and so that is what we call a citizen's initiative. Um, I would like to share with you now, um, so there are some countries where, um, where referendums are automatically triggered. Um, we call this a mandatory referendum, and this happens um, in most cases when you want to change the constitution. Um, so, for example, in Ireland, if you want to um, change the constitution, it is written in the constitution that everybody has to vote on it. This is an extra protection um, to ensure that, um, that a simple majority in parliament um, can just um, change sort of the basic democratic framework of a country, right? Um, and so what happened in Ireland is, is as you may know, Ireland is a, is a, a country that has a that is has deeply religious culture, uh, very that is that where the Catholic Church has had a very big impact on um, on policy making. And um, so, in the Irish Constitution, for a long time, it said that abortion um, was illegal and even uh, punishable by law. Um, this was something that um, that a, there was a sort of a political feeling that a lot of people wanted to change it, um, but it was a politically very difficult topic. So for politicians to touch it would have been um, would have been risky. And, and so um, the parliament actually preferred not to make legislation on it themselves. Um, but they asked a citizens assembly. Um, so a hundred randomly selected citizens um, that were sort of representative of, of Irish society because they had roughly the same age disparity, the same, um, the same gender, um, so 50-50 women and men, um, the same sort of geographical location and the same education background. They asked them to deliberate on what they thought of like um, whether or not abortion should be legal in Ireland. Um, and they came out with recommendations. These recommendations went to parliament. Parliament wrote a legal text based on the recommendations of these normal everyday citizens, right? And then everybody voted on this. Um, and so this is because in Ireland, um, if you want to change the constitution, you have to vote on this. Um, so, and this is how um, in 2018, um, abortion got taken. So the criminalization of abortion was taken out of the constitution. Um, and you will hear quite often that they vote in Ireland um, on questions like this. A couple of years before they voted on marriage equality, um, they've recently taken um, the interdiction on blasphemy out of the constitution. And later this year, they will vote um, on the role of women, because the Irish constitution um, right now still specifies that the place of a woman is in the home. And this is something um, that people would like to take out. And this, so because it is a change to the constitution, it will also be a referendum that will take place in November. Um, right. And so just as another um, sort of example of, uh, of, of an obligatory referendum, right? So where the constitution specifies that if you want to change it, you have to put it to a vote to everybody. Um, you may have heard that this week about the constitutional assembly in Chile. Um, so Chile has, is one of the most recent dictatorships in Latin America. Um, and the constitution that they currently still have is the one that was written by um, by, by the dictator in Chile. And so um, they have been trying to change it uh, for a couple of years. And so they had a, a, a very long process with, um, with citizens who were not randomly selected, but elected by different people, but they were not allowed to be representatives of political parties who drafted a new constitution proposal. Um, and because in Chile, you have to vote if you want to have a new constitution, um, there was a referendum on it last year, um, but that constitution proposal that was drafted by this citizens assembly um, was denied by the people because it was very long and complicated and, and, and sort of um, maybe too ambitious for, um, for a constitutional text. Um, and so you will have heard, and, that, and that's why I'm sharing it, um, that 
um, they're now starting a new process. Um, so they had elections in Chile just yesterday or the day before yesterday, where they elected now a constitutional assembly um, who will have to write this new constitution. So this time it is it, it is was really a matter of elections and parties were running, party representatives, and they will draft now this new constitution. Um, and the interesting thing, um, or what you may have seen, what, what you may have noticed in the news is that it's of course the opposition parties um, who have gotten a big majority in this um, in this assembly, um, and and which which seems that it will be a difficult process. But at the end of this process, there will be again a referendum because in Chile that is um, obligatory. And then finally, I would like to share. So all of the tools I've mentioned until now are bottom up, um, are, are bottom up instruments where people either collect signatures. Um, or it is specified by the law that in this specific case, a referendum will be automatically triggered. Um, but of course, there is also when, when we hear about referendums in the news, um, in most cases or very often, um, we will actually not be talking about referendums, but about what we call a plebiscite. Um, and these are top down instruments. So this means that the government or the parliament uh, representative authority who actually already have the right to make a certain decision, decide in a certain in a certain case to hand that decision back to the people, um, and so this is something that we generally do not consider good practice. And I think the most noticeable uh, or the most notable example that we have there is Brexit. Um, and so I'm, I'm sharing it with you as sort of a how not to do direct democracy uh, example. So. Um, the problem with this is that it that it's ad hoc, right? So so you're asking people once um, what they think about um, a specific question, but without people actually knowing if they will ever have a chance to to take that power again. And so what happens is that psychologically, a lot of people are not answering the question that is actually on the ballot, um, but let a lot of other people, a lot of other um, factors come into their decision making, um, because there is no foreseeable process, because there is no way to appeal to it. Um, and and it is just not something that is that is as Ina said um, sort of like baked into the into the legal framework and so um, that is something that that is just that we do not consider really direct democracy it is more um, yeah it is uh, it is in any case very bad practice and of course um, there were other problems with Brexit um, that we can maybe discuss about in the Q and A um, but. Um, yeah, this um, I will I will leave it at that. Um, yeah, so thank you very much. I will stop sharing my screen. Thank you very much, Carol. Um, and right now it's time for us to open up to our Q and A session. But I would like that everybody just put their questions in the chat, and I will be reading them out because we've had some interruptions. Um, so just in order to just keep it safe, I guess. Um, so our first question is from Reichen. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Um, it's for the German colleagues, so maybe Ina, you can take this one. Do you consider the option of e-voting over blockchain? Um, Ina? Yeah, yeah, sorry. Uh, maybe you just give me back the co-host so I can unmute myself. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think this is kind of an interesting question. Um, well, there is no political uh, will to implement e-voting yet. Uh, we, as the organization um, Mehr Demokratie, we have um, discussed a lot about e-voting, but yeah, like, Oh, there's always the same kind of arguments on how safe it, it is, how it's going to be, um, how can you um, do it in practice. Um, yeah, there's still, still a lot of um, issues or questions we need to solve because before we can like go more into campaigning for e-voting, there's I think there's no e-voting in Germany yet at no stages. Um, but um, what, an, what is another thing that we actually campaign for in Germany, um, especially on like the local and the state level is um, the uh, digital or the e-collection, uh, collecting the um, collection of digital signatures, because what we have now is um, a lot of paper that, it, that, that is used 
to collect signatures. Uh, we have a citizens initiative in uh, Schleswig-Holstein going on at the moment. And I think there's only place for like one signature at one page of paper. And well, this is like, uh, and if you need like 20,000 signatures, it's just insane to to collect all these signatures on paper on hand and when it comes to citizens initiatives um the signatures needs to be checked by um by the cities the people come from so sometimes you need to like send one um, paper with with signatures on to like four or three cities and this is like also um very harmful for the environment so what we um yeah what we a campaign for what we want is to introduce e collect and I think this would be the first step for Germany. Okay, thank you. Um, Caroline, did you want to, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I just, but, but Ina touched on it, like this verification um, of signatures is something that we hadn't talked about before, but it's really interesting, right? Um, so if you collect signatures, then um, then of course they want to be sure that you've collected signatures of actual people. Um, and so in, in most countries, they will have to check um, and so they, there's countries where you collect on paper where they check your actual signature if it matches the one that that you have on your passport. Um, so that is that's really interesting because that is sort of uh, 200 year old old technology that we're using for that um, while we have better tools um, today. And and the European Union, for example, allows um, or only allows uh, for ECI. Uh, no, it, it allows both. Um, it allows digital signature collection. So in ECI, um, because of the transnational nature of it, of course, also in the EU, um, you can sign that online. Um, so, so, so there are countries that, that have digital infrastructure, um, but it is, it's difficult and it's being implemented. Taiwan is, is one of the um, countries that has a lot of digital tools. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, our next question is from Wolfgang. Um, it says, should we not make a difference for democracy at different levels of governance? For example, direct democracy possible at local level, origin Athens, but hardly useful for global governance where omnilateralism should apply. Um, Caroline, do you want to take that one? Yeah, sorry, I don't want to be talking too much. Um, but um, yeah, so... I, I think we agree with you. So it's, it's definitely important to see um, what can work at which level. Um, and, and it's clear that what is most tangible to people is what happens in their neighborhoods, right, in their cities, um, where you can see real change. Um, but at the same time, there are things that affect our daily lives that can only be solved on the, on the global level or on the transnational level or on the national level. For example, if we think about climate change, that is not something... There are lots of cities legislating for climate change, but in the end, we will have to have rules on the global level. Um, and so I would say my philosophy to that, at least, is that that we should be able to democratically have a say in all of the all of the elements that that impact our lives. Um, and, and as we can see, for example, from the European Citizens Initiative, it is possible. Um, people are capable of sort of deciding on which level um something should be legislated and and you see that the topics that get this that get um proposed for citizens initiative on the european union are very difficult uh, very different to um, proposals that we get on the local level you know i live in bonn where we vote a lot on swimming pools um <laughs> for direct democracy like, like true direct democratic processes um and of course like when you on the European Union, I've I've signed things about digital rights or about human rights or labor rights, labor rights. Um, so it's different topics, but that doesn't mean that the mechanisms can't work um, on on different levels. Yeah. Okay, and then I have a comment. I think this is more of a comment, but I'll read it out anyway. It says, nowadays, there are three active referendum procedures in Bulgaria, one of them already overcoming the barrier of 400,000 valid signatures, support requirements in order to be obligatory for the Bulgarian parliament. One of the rest, still gaining support, referendum is about to amend the relevant special law. This person is for direct democracy. Um, but says civil civil initiatives are useful but pretty weak instruments according to according to their practice I guess. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if anybody wants to comment on that, but I think it was just a comment. And this is also another comment from Akon. 
Um, he said, um, sorry, they say it's a great novel idea, but at the, at the moment, there seems that there are, there are a lot of ifs and, use, and useless. There is a robust thrashing out of those ideas. It can be run into rough weather while putting it into practice. Yeah. Um, okay. So I, I would like to comment on that a little bit, if that's okay. <laughs> um, so so this is also part of, I think this is also what Ina said, right? So, so it is really about having good quality standards for direct democracy. So it's important to say that most of these tools, when we talk about citizens initiatives, when they're not agenda setting, they are not petitions, right? We are not asking for something. They are legally binding. Um, so, so it is really a majority of the people who are affected by a policy will be able to decide on that policy. So I think that is a very robust, um, robust process as it is. And, um, and of course, you need to, that needs to be accompanied by, by a good infrastructure for discussion between people. You need to have, um, you need to have ways to inform people about what, what their decision will mean, what effects that will have in the end. Um, but it, it is really more than just you know, having a discussion and, and, and handing something over and then wishing that, you know, somebody up there is going to do something. It is, it is everyday people deciding for themselves. Um, so I, I, I really think it doesn't get more robust than that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Carol. Um, I have a question from Oba Geng. He says, should referendum outcomes be revisited and, and after how long? I don't know, Klaus, maybe you can take this one. No, very simple, no. And <laughs> random outcomes should not be automatically revis uh, revis um, sorry, revisited, revisited, how you call it. So uh, it should, if people want to uh, change the law, they should change the law. But they should have a possibility to uh, Recall this law to veto this law, or however you ever uh, uh, want to call it, but never just automatically to have a process after a certain time amount is done to uh, revise uh, a law which is made by people. Okay, so they should probably start their own initiatives if they feel that there's an issue with that particular outcome that, that was passed. Yeah, they should start another initiative to recall this law, to veto the current law, which was done by people. Yeah. Oh. Okay, and then we have, a, I think this is more of a comment from Wolfgang again, um, direct crowdsourcing at global level should stop. Maybe, can I? Yeah, sure, Ina. Sorry, can I can I uh, answer to the question Klaus has just given an answer to? Um, well, I, I still had some kind of, um, but um, yeah, I would uh, also say that um, a rev you can only um, revisit a, um, a law made by the people. Um, uh, I, well, okay, starting the other way around. In Germany, at the local level in North Rhine-Westphalia, where I live, we have. Um, like citizens' initiatives um, in the cities, like Caro said before, for example, on um, yeah, um, on bath or something, and um, swimming pools. And what we um, are in Germany, we are in the local level on Northern Westphalia. We have the law that um, a referendum is binding for two years. So within two years, the um, local government has no chance to like revisit or uh, re. To, to change this law, but we have is well, what we have is the opportunity for another citizens initiative to say, okay, this was this um, decision was made by the people, but maybe we want to change it, so they need to collect signatures one more time. Um, yeah, what I think this is kind of it's good to have like um, a decision binding for a few years, like two or three years. At a minimum, so that um, yeah, the cit this is not the case that the citizens decide on something, and the government says, yeah, okay, well, uh, we implement the law, and one year later we say, oh no, we can't match it, so we just change it back. 
So uh, I think there must be some kind um, of a saving uh, for these um, decisions made by the citizens. Um, but I think it's, there should be the chance to yeah, revisite uh, laws made by citizens as well. I would also like to comment on that if that's okay. Um, because I, I think we have, sorry, <laughs> it's but it's a very interesting question. And, and I think we have like two, I have like two completely opposite examples where you where you have legislation sort of uh, in place to um, to protect it. And like what Ina says, like this rule um, of like, you can only revisit uh, something that's been decided by citizens initiative with another citizens initiative. Um, this one, this exists, for example, also in California in the US. Um, but there, there is no tem uh, there is no temporal limit on it. So, um, and if anything has been decided by citizens initiative, then for the for the rest of the future, you will only be able to revisit it by um, by citizens initiative. And this leads to very absurd situations where, for example, you can only uh, make decisions on taxes for schools or like taxes related to education through citizens initiative, because somebody once at some point launched a citizens initiative related to that. Um, so and that is of course something that that makes uh, that makes it very very rigid. So so I would say this this sort of like within two years that is a very important part of the rules in Germany, um, and and of course I think but I think more importantly like and on sort of a more philosophical plane, um, if you have a good practice of direct democracy, right? Um, if you vote regularly and if you know that the option is always open to you to collect signatures and to change the law then no definition is ever final. Like we don't live in societies that are cemented where everybody knows exactly where they think and this is how it's going to be forever. Like we are constantly changing. We are constantly talking to each other. We're constantly learning new things. And so of course it is also not problematic to change our mind about things, right? And so this is in a good direct democracy that is baked into the system. So, um, and this is sort of like, um, Maybe what's also important is the concept of the happy loser there. If you lose the referendum, um, like if, you know, by by a couple of percentage points, you you will not be upset about that because you've had your chance of, of bringing your topic to the, to the general population and you found that maybe the time is not right for it yet or that people don't agree with you. That doesn't mean that the option is closed to you forever. This isn't, this isn't Brexit. This isn't a one-off um, and we'll never talk about this again. Um, so... So, so I think what's really important is to to have these, is is having these avenues open to you, is having the possibility to always revisit, um, to always revisit decisions we've made. Like nobody lives their lives making one decision and then sticking it with for, with it for the rest of their lives. So, with, why should we do that with our democracies? Yeah, I completely agree. Um, okay, we have a comment from Wolfgang. Um, he says, direct crowdsourcing at global level should stop the COP process against climate change. I think that's just a comment. Um, do you want to say anything to that? Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm not sure. Um, do you mean that if we would have a, a citizens initiative uh, on the global level that people would vote against climate change legislation or they would be because my feeling is there are so many global movements um like that are like fridays for future um, there are so many people around the world already being affected by climate change i think if we would put it to a vote to the global population if we would have a referendum on the global level right i think people would vote for um for more um more radical climate change legislation than most of our governments do. But of course, I haven't done any research on this or any survey, so I, I, I can't, can't vouch for that. But what I do know is that in, in countries where they ask the citizens to make climate change, so there's a lot of citizens assemblies, for example, that draft climate change, that citizens tend to take more radical action than their governments do. Um, so I'm actually quite optimistic that if we would ask everybody that we would come up with better legislation than we have at the moment. Yeah, thank you. Our next question is from Obergeng again. It says, in the case of a narrow <laughs> victory in a referendum, can there be a referendum on the same issue? Um, maybe Ina, would you like to take this one? Yeah, I can. Well, as I said before, um, 
I would say it, it would not be useful. Um, or I think the only way to have a second referendum on a narrow, when the referendum comes to a very narrow um, result is that there's again a citizen's initiative collecting signatures to bring it to a second uh, referendum. I say that um, well, it's, it's a democratic, um, democratic rule that majority decides. And if the majority is 5.1, I would say, okay, the majority has um, has spoken. Well, if you want to, um, yeah, if you want to um, have like um, more or bigger majorities, I think in some cases when it comes to uh, referendums on constitutions, in some German states, you have the rule that they need to be accepted by two thirds or something. So you have like a, a higher threshold um, um, but I would say, yeah, as I said before, um, yeah, if if it if it's a narrow um, result and the initiative wants to have it, um, yeah, um, have an, another referendum about it, they should cast another uh, citizen's initiative. Um, Klaus and, and Carol, you guys don't want to add anything to that. Um, okay, we can move on to the next question or comment. I think Brexit is an example of a referendum that should be voted on again. However, I agree with Klaus that it should not be automatic. I mean, maybe I can take that because I brought up Brexit. Uh, <laughs> we shouldn't bring up Brexit in these meetings. Uh, <laughs> um, so I think you should even, um, I agree, it should be voted on again, but I would take it further, like there should be a, an existing process for people to decide what is important to them and what they want to vote on. So I think the problem with Brexit is that it was a referendum on a topic that was actually not very important to people at the time where it was proposed, right? It was a it was a discussion within the Tory party that they couldn't resolve within their party, and so they um, they, they took it to the general people. And so they asked people to think about something that they have never thought about, that they didn't know how it was going to affect their lives. Um, and, and they did it with, I mean, with misinformation um, and, and <laughs> with, um, in, in a very short timeline and, and with very vague wording. So most people who voted didn't know what they were actually, what, what that was going to do, right? Um, so, I, yes, it definitely it was a very flawed referendum. I think it never should have happened in the first place. Um, but if we're gonna have a vote on that again, then I would prefer for the, for the UK to have sort of a citizens initiative process where citizens can collect signatures. Because if you make it, citizens collect signatures, then at least that shows that there is a sort of a groundswell in the population of people who think this is an important issue. This is something that we should talk about. Um, and I think Brexit, now it would be the case, but I think when it was brought up as a referendum topic, I don't think it was a groundswell topic at all. Yeah, thank you, Carol. Um, a question from Gabriel. Um, he says, what should there, but should there be a possibility to sign against an initiative if I disagree with it? Could it work? Um, maybe... Klaus, maybe you can take this on. Well, uh, you can, uh, if you uh, think about voting in the sense of the final vote of citizens, of course, you can vote against the initiative proposal. Uh, if you mean that uh, you don't want to have the initiative to be on the way, uh, Maybe you can do a counter proposal and start an own initiative. Uh, so uh, this is what I can say, but you cannot uh, avoid uh, people signing uh, signatures for a certain proposal, but you can start your own proposal, a proposal uh, being against something. Thank you, Klaus. Um, another one from Obergang. Looking at how societal view constantly evolves, how do we protect citizen instruments from misuse by extremist groups spreading misinformation? I don't know who would like to take this one. 
Well, I can I can start maybe. Mm -hmm. It's okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. This is like the um, argument we hear the most against direct democracy. It's always the same. It's always like, oh, but what about the misuse? What about populist people using direct democracy? And um, well, what we see in practice in Germany, and yeah, we we don't have like nationwide. Um, referendum, but what we have is a very vivid local democracy. We have over 8,000 citizens initiatives on the local level in Germany. And what we see uh, from this practice is that we hardly see misuse of uh, citizens initiatives in Germany, because um, there are some points that make it makes it hard for like um, smaller groups, populist groups, uh, white ring groups to yeah, to come up with the whole uh, whole process, as I said before, the length of the process, you need to bring up a topic for um, sometimes several several years to bring it from collecting signatures to the referendum. So this is a very long process, and uh, especially if you have like some some um, issues that just came up, um, like these quick shots I mentioned before. Um, yeah, they, it's it's not usable. Direct democracy. See, it's a it's it's a process that takes a lot of time. So, yeah, it prevents from these uh, quick shots. And the other big thing uh, which works against it is um, you need a high number or you need um, a relevant number of signatures to be collected. So, um, if your topic is populist, if your topic is right winged, it it's hard for you to campaign for your topic, to collect these signatures, because you need to find a lot of people that think um, the same way that you do. And um, yeah, I think one, one other argument is that, um, especially in Germany, um, the um, citizens initiative needs to match to the constitution. So we have a protection, for example, of minorities. So this um, prevents some uh, citizens initiatives to be started as well. So um, yeah, what we learn from the use of direct democracy on the local level in the German states is that um, yeah, there's hardly any misuse of direct democratic initiatives. Okay, um, just because we are running out of time a little bit, I'm gonna move on to the next question. This is a comment on the climate, the climate change question that came earlier. Carol, it says the understanding, for example, of climate change is very limits in, limited in the general public. And then on to our next question. Um, it's directed to you, Carol. Um, do you think citizen citizen delegates de dedicates enough time to understand the complexities of the radical climate change measures they support? Yeah. So yeah, so there's a, a lot of, um, I see a lot of comments in the chat sort of doubting that people um, are, are capable of understanding um, climate change or, and I think in general, this is a question that we get asked a lot. Like, can we trust people to make good decisions? And like, just fundamentally, I always feel like the person asking that question feels like they are capable of making good decisions, but nobody else is, um, which, is which is very interesting. Um, so I, I would say the practice proves that like in Switzerland, in Germany, on the local level, in countries where they have direct democracy and like like process direct democracy, right, with, with citizen like with a robust system, with, with, with recurring votes, with citizens initiatives, um, people are absolutely capable of understanding very, very complicated topics. Um, for example, in Switzerland, they regularly vote um, because Switzerland is, is not part of the European Union, but it is part of Schengen, um, which means that it has to be in line for some part with, uh, with the regulations of the European Union market and, and, um, and, and, and um, open um, air, area of, of free movement, right? Um, and so regularly there will be citizens initiatives that would, that would change sort of the treaty that Switzerland has with the EU. Um, and so that, that's obviously a very complex, complex matter. Um, and, and you would expect, you know, people who say that people aren't able to understand climate change would surely probably also argue that people aren't able to understand the complexities of treaties between the European Union and, and Switzerland, um, which I think is way, way more abstract than climate change. 
Um, but but people vote on that regularly, and they have not left the Schengen area yet. And they, they so they they seem to under they I think they demonstrate that they understand that people are very capable of of integrating information, of informing themselves, and and of of making good deci good decisions, right? Um, and and the thing is with with climate change, we do have some evidence, um, not so much uh, from direct democratic processes because there are not so many countries that have them. Um, but for example, in Switzerland, there have been votes um, on um, on promoting local uh, local farming um, on 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 supply chain um, safety, which which also have indirect indirectly an effect on like climate change regulation, right? Um, or in Luzern, they voted uh, for a for for a climate change package. So, so I I think the experience that we have, like on the local level, in a, a lot of cities, have like people have voted for more radical climate change measures than than representatives have. Um, and something that we that we also see a lot is um, climate change citizens assembly. So this is a, a different democratic instrument, but we had one on the global level where 100 citizens were randomly selected to participate um, in a citizens assembly. So this is a, a different process. This is it's more deliberative, right? So it's normal randomly selected citizens chosen to represent the global population on some characteristics, gender, age. Um, in the case of the global assembly, it was even literacy. So there were people there who were, who were not able to read. Um, and they were given assistance by, by local people to sort of understand the information that was presented to them to, to use the technology well. Um, and these 100 citizens who were absolutely representative of, of the global population, who, who share characteristics with the global population, um, like demographically, they, they came up with recommendations to combat climate change that are way more radical than anything the, the COP has ever decided. Um, so I think there is plenty of evidence that shows that if we would ask people and if we would have that debate really in a good, meaningful way, um, that, that people are in favor of continuing to live on this planet. Thank you, Carol. Um, Ina and Klaus, would you guys like to add to that? If not, we can move on to this could be a question or a comment. I, I, I would add like um only in short yeah uh, i totally agree to you caro i think we need to trust people and that people come up with the best decisions um but i think what is kind of crucial is um the part of information so what is needed to come up to uh to good in order to make people uh have good uh well-informed um yeah, decisions is to provide good information. So, as I said, the, the example from Switzerland, we have the booking, voting um, booklet where you have uh, different arguments in favor and against uh, the issue of hand. And I think something like that is needed to, um, or is one way to provide uh, citizens with the um, information they need uh, to base their, um, yeah, to, to base their own mind uh, on a certain issue. And and what we also see um, coming from a little, uh, a small example from Germany, from the local level, uh, again, uh, in the last five years, uh, we've seen that they are the most um, voted on issues on climate um, topics, like um, whatever, um, um, yeah, some, all, all uh, issues that, were, that are voted on that were somehow related to climate issues, uh, most of them, uh, ended in favor of um, climate protection. So we see that most people yeah, decide to protect their planet and to want to live on it further. Yeah, I would definitely vote in that area as well. Um, thank you, Ina. And this, um, maybe just as a last comment, yes, they would vote against global, global change, global climate change legislations as they might see as an attempt to stop their development Plus, their political elites have already voiced the same reason on many occasions, even when they are not responsible for the historical increase, increase in per capita emissions. Um, and then we have um, this, it's a petition from Keith. Um, 
around, it's on a global referendum on climate change. And I think that brings us to the end of our webinar today. Um, thank you so much to all the speakers that um, have come today, Caroline, um, Ina and Klaus. Um, we really appreciate all the, the amazing input that you guys have brought forward to us today. Um, and just before we close, I would just like to say that we have in the series, we have two more webinars coming up. There's one on the 24th of May and there's one on the 7th of June. On the 24th of May, we are speaking about can direct democracy be used on a transnational level? And on the 7th of June, we are speaking about why direct democracy doesn't work. If you'd like to take part in these webinars, they're going to be hosted on these dates. Um, and I also would like to encourage you to join our community. Um, I've left a link in, in, in our chat and you will be getting mailings about the webinars that are to come if you join our community but also if you're part of our mailing list you will get those mailings as well um yeah thank you everybody for coming and goodbye <laughs> <laughs>